Box. Uh, I'm your host tonight, James Israel, and uh, we're going to be talking uh, about um, money and politics and some other fun issues like that with uh, Jim Forbes tonight. Uh, but let me tell you about the sponsors um, that are sponsoring the show. We have Pieces Pizza by the Slice, including low-fat, vegetarian, and gluten-free uh, options, as well as a fine selection of beer, wine, and soft drinks. And we want to thank them for supplying pizza for the crew. They're at, uh, uh, that is 1309 21st Street, Sacramento. Uh, you can call them at 441-1949. Uh, also, the Humor Times, which bills itself as the world's funniest news source. The monthly political humor magazine is available worldwide by subscription in print or digital format. Subscription info along with cartoons, funny fake news, videos, and more can be found at humortimes.com. Uh, we are also sponsored by Doctors Clinic for Men, Sacramento's only clinic devoted to the treatment of erectile dysfunction. For information, you can go to sacdc4m.com or call 916-482-5200. So uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you're on Facebook, please check in at our uh, Facebook page um, where you can uh, comment on shows or just talk about anything. It's facebook.com slash soapbox sack. And then don't forget to check out uh, the archive of the past shows that we have on the YouTube channel. Uh, just go to YouTube and put uh, Soapbox Sacramento in the search box, and that'll come up. And there's uh, all kinds of past shows there for you to peruse. So tonight's guest is Jim Forbes. He's a political talk radio host on KUBU, which is Access Sacramento's radio station. We're the TV station, and he's over there on the uh, radio station side. And uh, he does a political talk radio show there. Uh, what's the name of the show? It's uh, the US, US Blues. Blues, that's right, yeah. which yeah. is a, a great name. And uh, you got a great theme song for it, too. Dedicated to Jerry Garcia himself, yeah. Yeah. Grateful Dead. Yeah, so, yeah. always loved that song. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you're Jim, I'm James. I guess this is the Jim and James show tonight. <laughs> there you go. And uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, uh, political finance uh, uh, and the sorry state of uh, affairs of of politics and what, and maybe talk about what we might do about it, what could be done. So, uh, what what do you think is going to decide the 2016 election, there, Jim? Well, uh, fear and loathing uh -huh. is one one okay. answer. Yeah, it um, seems to be that way. Feeling of insecurity that a lot of voters have, and mm -hmm. then uh, just this massive, uh, massive unhappiness, anger, really, at the establishment, right. political establishment that. People, a whole lot of people in this country feel like have been left them behind. On both left and right. Exactly. And then uh, exactly. the left has one solution, which is to go to uh, social, social, socialist democracy or whatever you want to call that, um, like uh, Bernie Sanders Bernie. style. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on the right, you got people gravitating towards uh, Donald Trump. Exactly right. And, you know, I, I don't think that. Uh, um, you know, I, I think that there are all kinds of solutions to the problem, but I think that yeah. to uh, to get to the solutions, we really need to understand what the problem is, and why it's a problem. So that's that's generally my focus is just trying to, you know, zero in on on exactly why this is a problem, why it's a mess, and and why it's um, it's making people distrustful of their own government. Yeah, it's uh, it's a big problem when uh, you know for a democracy to try to function when when people don't even trust. The government, and of yeah. course, you know, there's good reason not to. Um, it, it's in a lot of ways just a shell of the democracy at this point. What with all the shenanigans around elections, uh, not only all the money that's polluting the process, but uh, all, all these tricks that uh, you know you see playing out in different states where they're trying to basically yeah. keep people from registering yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to vote, um, yeah. as well as, you know, just a lot of other challenges. What, what, what other problems would you see there besides those two? Wow. Well, um, you know, the list is really pretty endless when you get into just exactly yeah. how money uh, disrupts and corrupts the system. Right. But, you know, we've got, we've got uh, politicians in Congress now that, that actually spend 30 to 70 percent of their time fundraising. 
um, because the cost of, of running for election these days is just astronomical. And, you know, we might as well go to, um, I brought a, a chart, it's uh, picture number one, if, um, if your folks could put it up on the screen. But um, this will show you basically what the problem is. So this chart starts back in 1976. And what we see there is that in 76, and these are in today's dollars, inflation adjusted, it cost an average of about $150,000 to get elected to a seat in Congress. And then the Supreme Court um, did the dubious uh, deed of passing a, or voting on a case called Buckley versus Vallejo. Now, Buckley versus Vallejo was little recognized at the time. It kind of slid by under the radar. There wasn't any public uh, recognition or outcry about it, but it did two really important things. It was the first time the Supreme Court clearly said that money has the same rights as free speech under the Constitution. Right. And then the other thing they did is they said, that um, there can be limits on how much somebody donates to a politician, but there can't be any limit on how much the politician spends of their own money. Mm. And the idea was that if you're, if you're a very wealthy politician, then you can't, you know, your own money is not going to corrupt yourself. Mm. But what they didn't get, because, you know, these people never ran for elected office, most of them, what they didn't get is that it corrupts the whole election process. Because if, um, for example, if a very wealthy person is going to run for office using their own millions, the competition, the opponent's going to have to raise millions. And that means the opponent's going to have to be on the phone begging for money. Um, it's got to be from the people that have the money to donate. And that means the very wealthy. And yeah. so the politicians are spending 30 to 70% of their time just listening to the concerns of the wealthy. Right, exactly. And, and, uh, and if that guy does get in, then he's going to have to pay some favors back. If the rich guy gets in, well... He's going to represent the wealthy too, so it's either way. And it's a it's a never-ending process. I mean, you know, we, we don't really have any downtime between elections anymore, and so right. the fundraising goes on every day, 24/7, and um, and because of that, the the people in office, uh, whether it's in the House or in the Senate or president or you know you name it, state legislatures, um, their mind is just constantly on getting enough money to win exactly. and conversely or perversely, um, <laughs> making sure that the money that's out there being offered doesn't go to their opponent. Yeah. So there's all kinds of intrigue and skullduggery and that kind of thing that goes on behind the scenes that we never really hear very much about. But the so money itself is corrupting. They're spending a, a huge amount of time fundraising, mm -hmm. so they got no time to do the people's business. And then when they do have some time to actually work in Congress, they're mm -hmm. working for the interest that, that uh, paid their way to get in. Exactly. So, so and what the rest of that chart showed, I, I wanted to finish that thought, but it... Yeah, um, the Citizens so, United... Yeah, and back in 76, and about 150000 in today's dollars. So right. an honest person could raise that kind of money in a two-year cycle just through, you know, bake sales and dinners and things like that. Um, but as you see, after Buckley versus Vallejo was decided, every election cycle, it ticked up and ticked up and ticked up. And then mm -hmm. you get to 2010, and Citizens United was decided, and it just goes through the roof. Right. And so now, it was over a million even before Citizens United. Right. And, and now, now right here in Sacramento County, the uh, 7th Congressional District was Ami Barra versus Doug Osi last year. They each spent $10 million bucks. Ten million, each. and that's just the house. And the that's Senate just the house. is way worse, and right. then, of course, presidency is right. astronomical. So, yeah, it's re it's really pretty obscene. Yeah, that's um, does, just doesn't seem like a good way to pick our leaders. You know, um, no. seems more like a um, what they're like a, they're buying their way in, basically. Well, they're buying their way in, and they have to do it by relying on the on the ultra wealthy. What exactly. you know, Bernie Sanders would have called the millionaires and billionaires, yeah. but um, it is the 1%, percent and because and, it's the 1% are pretty much the only people that have the money to do it. And then, um, just to put a really harsh point on it, but this is uh, reality, the Sunlight Foundation did a study, and they found out that uh, on average, for every dollar that an ultra-wealthy person puts into a political campaign, uh, they can expect to get $760 back. So whether it's uh, campaign money or whether they're spending it on lobbyists, mm -hmm. they're going to get that back in the form of tax breaks or, right. um, or you know, subsidies for their corporation or um, that's a good deal. Government contracts. <laughs> well, it's you, you can know see what? why they do it. <laughs> and, and here's another point that, that I wanted to make tonight, and that is that 
you know, Washington, and this is part of why people are just so fed up with the whole system, but Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, should not be a place where people go to get wealthy. Right. But it's turned into that. Right. And I'm old enough to remember going to Washington, D.C. when I was in high school. And, you know, you'd go into restaurants, even restaurants near Capitol Hill, and there'd be, you know, sort of peeling linoleum on the floor. And <laughs> maybe there'd be cloth or paper tablecloth, if there's any <laughs> tablecloth at all. Um, and nowadays, same restaurant, you go in and it's nothing but uh, leather-bound menus and sterling silver and valet mm. parking. And it's just, you know, it's a totally different world since that Supreme Court decision in 76, and especially since right. Citizens United in 2010. Yeah, uh, money is speech, That's, uh, that doesn't seem right. And then also, um, people, uh, corporations are people now. Yeah, that's... So uh, that's, you know, so they're, they get all, but the funny thing is they get all the benefits mm -hmm. of being a person, right. but they don't, they're not treated like real people in when it comes to, you know, having to really obey the law and uh, pay for your, you know, pay penalties or whatever. They, they yeah. scoot their way out of all those Can't things. Can't put them in jail. And, you know, right. if you look at the statistics, there's some really pretty amazing and horrifying uh, uh, facts out there. But um, the, the biggest serial criminal in the United States of America is actually British Petroleum. And if you look at all the environmental yeah. crimes that they've committed, it's, it's far more than any human being could ever begin to commit in a lifetime. So you, you've been a prosecutor, mm -hmm. um, you worked on consumer protection, mm -hmm. and uh, then bankruptcy. Was that what, what you did as a prosecutor? No, no. Oh. Those are, um, I, I've, I've uh, kind of jumped around a little bit in my yeah. career, but I've been a lawyer since 1978. I'm kind of a recovering lawyer now, okay. uh, semi-retired. <laughs> but I, I did uh, criminal prosecution. I wanted to get the trial experience. I wanted to learn a little more about the real world. and. So on then, consumer protection was a big eye opener. But um, the real big eye opener for me on this issue of money and politics was uh, I was a bankruptcy lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I just did personal uh, bankruptcies. And um, I was doing them during the crash of, uh, of 08. Oh, okay. And I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was seeing all of these responsible, upstanding citizens coming into my office day after day. And the only mistake that they had made, the only miscalculation was that they'd invested in real estate mm -hmm. during the bubble. Right. Well, so I, I wanted to find out why that happened. So, um, so this is kind of how I got to the money and politics issue, but I, I back, you know, backtracking on the, all these people coming in, having done nothing wrong, uh, but having to declare bankruptcy uh, to get back on their feet. So I started looking into what was it that caused this housing bubble. And what I found out was that in 1992, the um, Congress and then President Clinton signed the law. It was called the uh, Derivative Deregulation Act of 1992. And what that did is it, it gave Wall Street banks especially the right to issue derivatives, which is where you take a whole lot of contracts and you combine them together and then you sell them off as investments. Mm -hmm. And they were doing that with mortgages, as you're probably aware. Right. And um, they could be totally opaque about it because deregulation in this case meant only one person, only one side really knows what's in those derivatives, mm -hmm. and that was the banks. And so there was stuff in these derivatives full of really lousy mortgages. And they sold them as like AAA, AAA. or some, some kind of super great yeah, thing. Yeah, because they were paying the fees for the rating full of, agencies. Basically full of rotten tomatoes, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah, that's that's amazing that they could get away with that when you think about well, it. Well, when yeah. it blew up, it you know that's real estate is such a huge part of the American economy that yeah. when it blew up, it just dragged everything down. With well, it. everyone considered that the you know the investment as an individual, the, your best investment was real estate. Real I estate. Mean, that's what everyone right. wanted a house, pay it exactly. off eventually, and then you own something you can pass on to your kids, whatever. Right. It's the American way, you know, the American dream. Absolutely, so, the American uh, dream. But um, just kind of all came crashing down there. Because well, it, and the reason it crashed down is because it was hyperinflated. It was really very right. much like the, the stock market crash in 1929. And uh, similarities there are that they were both opaque. I mean, mm -hmm. the stock market uh, bubble happened in, in 29 because corporations didn't really have to report what their, you know, what their earnings were, what their net worth was. Um, you know, the, the New Deal put the Securities Exchange Commission in place. All of a sudden, we could see what was behind those stocks. Right. So investors could make a more intelligent decision. But this uh, Derivative Deregulation Act um, took all the requirements for transparency out. Mm -hmm. 
And so only only one side knew what was behind those mortgage or mortgage backed securities. Um, the investors had no clue, but they kept you know everybody kept bidding it up. And mm -hmm. because um, because uh, a mortgage broker could instantly sell a mortgage, if you issued a mortgage, you could instantly sell it to Goldman Sachs or whoever. They'd bundle it up. That incentivized the mortgage brokers to sell more, sell more and more mortgages, right. and so they got their standards went to right. you know, went to pot. And, and anyway, they it got to the point where basically you just say what it is that you earn. And exactly, they, they take it right. at its face value, and and then the okay, appraisal you're on the qualified. exactly, <laughs> and then the appraisal on the house you're about to buy yeah. was just whatever whatever you you or the you know some appraiser wrote down. The mm -hmm. banks were just buying it wholesale because, see, the banks were no longer carrying the risk. If the if the bank or the mortgage broker, however you want to characterize them, uh, was able to sell off the mortgage the minute they issued it, mm -hmm. they'd get their money then. Right. And it didn't matter if right. the loan went sour. What happened there after that? Yeah. So, um, but that was okay. Just 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 to finish that point, yeah. that was because Wall Street uh, actually donates about forty percent of all the money that politicians raise for elections, and they also spend about forty percent of all the lobbying money. And so they were able to just sort of buy their way into that legislation, right. and they got President Clinton to sign it, and there we went. So anyway, that's what got me involved in it. It's just, now yeah. wait a minute, that that's not right, and that yeah. ruined a lot of people's lives, and their people are still hurting. Right. But I realized that it was the the money in politics that has you know that was the villain of that story. Um, so this may be getting it. off the track a little bit, but the 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 conclusion that we've come to now, as a result of all that is, is uh, these big corporations now have bought up all these houses. Yes. And now they're the, renter, they're the landlords for yeah. America now, basically. And it's, <laughs> you know, that's a whole other mess because they're, they're absentee landlords. Mm -hmm. um, they don't really, in, you know, I mean, there's been so many complaints. They don't take care of the place. They don't they have mm -hmm. no incentive to, really. And the rents are going up because of it. and. Uh, so anyway, that's, well, you might that's remember a, a famous uh, famous board game called Monopoly, and that's yes. exactly what we've been through. Right, is that uh, you know the the Wall Street banks and the hedge funds wound up owning the houses, and now we've turned in from we've gone from a nation of owners to a nation of renters. Right, and that's and that's why people are furious. I yeah. mean, they're and rightfully so. And right. I think I think it's going to have an impact. It's already had a huge impact on the election. So yeah, so that, that brings me to uh, what I was going to ask you next is um, so how do, how does all this figure into the Trump slash Clinton uh, right. election? Uh, assuming Bernie doesn't pull off the uh, the near <laughs> impossible here at the Democratic uh, convention, like uh, a lot of people unlikely. still think he can. We'll see. Well, I'm going to uh, assume that he doesn't. Yeah, I, but uh, I think it's a pretty safe bet that it'll be Clinton. Okay, so we got what that means is that we got Hillary, who is very clearly establishment, versus Donald Trump, who's very clearly not. Although well, that's getting yeah. a little less clear all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's establishment in that he's a rich guy that's been taking advantage right. of the system all these years, mm -hmm. and he's so proud of how well he's been able to, you know, Right. Uh, hide behind these bankruptcy laws and screw his investors and make a lot of money at it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's establishment in that way. But no, he's never held held a public office. Right. Uh, which some people see as a uh, a good qualification for holding public office. I never quite understood that. Uh, um, yeah. It's like you know uh, we need a the best engineer we can get. So let's hire this plumber over here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that I think what that's motivated by is. Uh, a lot of people are just so fed up with the system the way it is that they're thinking, let's just play 52 card pickup. Let's right. just toss the whole thing up in the air and hope it comes back down together, you know, um, better for better for the average Joe. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, and, and yeah, and I I, I did kind of loosely say that Trump is sort of the anti-establishment. I think that's how he was perceived during the primary. But um, you know, he's doing a lot of things that that the very wealthy. One percent elites have have always done in this country, um, and that is he 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 pits two struggling, less affluent groups against each other. He's right. pitting the former um, formerly middle class Americans. Oh, we have a Trump cartoon up. Oh, right. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> he uh, he pretended to be his own advisor on, right. uh, on a telephone and or his own uh, agent, and then they got caught at it. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, making fun of the media, or the <laughs> media has become his enemy, basically. 
Well, and that's another, you know, that's a whole other story about how America's kind of going off the rails is because we, you know, we don't, as a country, we don't operate off the same fact sheet anymore. You know, it used to be everybody watched the same TV news, everybody read the same newspapers. But now with the internet and with people like Donald Trump just trashing the media at every turn, you know, you've got a lot of people out there that want to believe it, you know, that want to believe they're just being fed a bunch of lies. Mm -hmm. And, um, yep. but, you know, Donald does other, he plays, uh, you know, rich person's game a lot. I mean, pitting, you know, two poor, that, that's not a new game. That's uh, Martin Luther King talked mm -hmm. about that a lot. The, right. and, and what it does is it distracts the two less affluent groups from paying attention to what the big money folks really are doing. Exactly, they're fighting each other instead of the powers that be that are really causing the problems. Exactly. Uh, Trump is also really good at um, convincing people he's one of them. You know, yeah. he seems Go to figure. have a knack for that. I guess it's the way he talks. He talks in simple terms, you know, simple sentences. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, he's so far from the average Joe. Uh, he's basically the opposite. Um, but that's, you know, that's, I think that's why he's done as well as he has. He's, uh, a lot of people seem to relate to him. Uh, this is another cartoon uh, shown with the Republican establishment as to how they're trying to deal with the uh, Trump iceberg. <laughs> Make sure your best <laughs> well, let's just uh, shift to this. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah you know, I, he, Trump has been good for, uh, for one segment of the society, I would say, the, the political comedians and cartoonists. <laughs> cartoonists. <laughs> he's been really good for that. But uh, he's really, you know, he's no, it, it, he's no accident, okay? I think that he's a very well studied. He, he knows yeah. the media from all his years doing, you know, reality shows sure. and that kind of thing. And what well, he's, This is like the ultimate reality show for him. It is. Yeah. It is. And you know what? And, and at some level, I think that he probably doesn't even care if he loses. Yeah, because I, I he'll get have that feeling too. the yeah. world's greatest name, Rick. You know, well, you know, when he first got into it, that, you know, him and, and his little team there, they, you know, I've read. It seems like I read something from, from someone who used to be on his team or whatever, but they had no no uh, idea that it would go this far. No, yeah. you know, they yeah. thought if they could get 20% during the primaries, they'd be doing great, and it would help him with his next show or another book or whatever. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they could raise some issues. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really taken off beyond, I'm sure, what he ever thought it would. It, it really has. And he's, he's playing on uh, Americans' emotions, you know. There have been a lot of studies, especially recently, at least that I've become aware of, that, um, that show, you know, people don't really, when they, when they go into the voting booth or many of the other decisions in their lives, they're not really um, analyzing facts. They're, they're basically doing a gut check on everything. Mm -hmm. And so if it feels right, you know, it's what Stephen Colbert would have called truthiness. You right. know, if, it, right. if it feels true, it must be true. And so, you know, but generally speaking, Americans really don't like cheaters. Um, they don't like unfairness. They don't like feeling helpless. They don't like feeling left out. They don't like the polarization and gridlock that, that we're seeing in government. Those things, you know, the, especially the polarization and gridlock are caused by income inequality. Uh, at their root, but Trump has a real special way of, of playing to that and just making people feel like they're being cheated, and in many ways they are. Yeah. Um, but he, he's, he's just a master, I guess, I'm going to say, at uh, manipulating that. Yeah, and if people really looked at his record, he's done some cheating himself. <laughs> <laughs> he's avoided taxes to well, a huge degree. Trump University. Uh, Trump or... University, you know, one of the huge fraud that that he laid over on people that, that couldn't afford it, you know? He, he robbed them blind. Right. Um, right. So, you know, it would seem like people would start waking up to that, and if they really don't like cheaters, you know, it wouldn't back in. But I think, I think what it comes down to is there's, there's a, a certain um, segment of the population that will always vote Republican, mm -hmm. another certain segment that will always vote Democrat, and so the the ones who are going to always vote Republican, they're, they're like flailing around. They, they don't see any good candidates. Right. So that's probably why they ended up with him, you know. <laughs> um, and they just want desperately to be able to believe in one of these guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess they're hanging on to that. But, um, but you know, he, just, does, he, he does make some, some pretty good points about, about the former middle class, I'll call him that, because it's... Middle class has been on the decline since about 1976. If you look at the charts, that's yeah. pretty much when things started going badly for them. Um, but what he is able to uh, show them 
uh, or at least what they, I, well, of course, when somebody talks, it's not what you say, it's what people hear, mm -hmm. right? And, and when he talks, what people hear is that, okay, I'm being cheated, and here's the strong man that's gonna save me, that's gonna mm -hmm. bail me out. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he, he touched on these points early, but, you know, when you look at his written, you know, program, if you look at his website, you see he doesn't really believe very much of it at all. Mm -hmm. But the point is, when, when money is able to buy political power, and when you have income and, and wealth inequality, then political power is unequal. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you've lost your democracy. And I think that people have a sense that that's what's happened. And I think that Trump appeals to a substantial percentage of those people. Sure. But they're, they're analyzing it wrong. Right. You know, they're not I mean, seeing the, the, real, the real bad thing. And that is, you know, I mean, during the, the great heyday that, you know, Trump wants to make us great again, okay. Well, that was probably the 1950s and, oh yeah, okay, well, here's, <laughs> this, is, this is the Supreme Court. This is, the, the, uh, Anthony Kennedy, Justice Kennedy started out. But, you know, this is an example of the Supreme Court just not getting it about, about actual, you know, political reality. But they, they admit in Citizens United and later in McCutcheon, they admit that money buys access to politicians and in influence over politicians. But then he goes on and says, but access and influence alone don't corrupt the politician and they're not gonna make people lose faith in their democracy. And I, think, I don't think there are really very many people in this country at all that believe that. Yeah. So, um, well, so we're anyway, they got, up. they got us way off course. And yeah, we got I, yeah I agree. Well, it's going to be interesting uh, to see what happens here at these upcoming conventions. Um, we've only got a few seconds left here. Um, what do you uh, what do you think? Are you going to be watching the uh, Republican convention? Oh yeah, you bet. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's going to be very entertaining. Yeah. Uh, I hope so. There's a lot of promise there, anyway. Yep. So uh, thanks for watching, uh, everybody. And uh, check us out on YouTube and go to the Facebook uh, page and let us know what you think. Thanks a lot for uh, watching tonight and uh, good night. so much in fantasy that reality never had a chance. I want to be free. 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 I want to be free.